I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening. Welcome back Streetwalkers. This episode is with Trina Lafargue. Trina is an actress based in Nolens, Louisiana and can currently be seen in the hit film Five Feet Apart and the hit television show Claws. Also, she will be in the upcoming Noah Centineo vehicle, The Perfect Date, on Netflix. In this episode, we talk about growing up in Nolens, Louisiana, and what made her decide to become an actress. We also talk about what she does when she's not acting, which is career counseling for actors. Plus, Trina gives us some tips on how to stay motivated and how to keep your eye on the prize, even when times are tough and things might not be going as planned. So enjoy, folks. This is actress Trina Lafargue. Yeah, talk to me, yeah. Welcome to Fascination Street, Trina Lafargue. How are you doing this afternoon, Trina? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for having me. It is absolutely my pleasure. So, Trina, where were you born and raised? Born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Wow, you said that like you're for real, too. Oh, yeah, I'm proud of it. I'm a natural NOLA girl. <laughs> Love it. Uh, my wife and I have been there a couple of times. It's been a while, but uh, we we used to go there. We live in San Antonio, and so, you know, that's not too far. So mm-hmm. we would go, I don't know, probably every other year for, I don't know, like a decade or something. We love that place. That place is awesome. Do you come down for Mardi Gras, Jazz Fest, Essence, what? Nothing. Just because. like, Just because. Yeah, we don't, we're not really let's go throw beads at people like in a giant crowd. We're not those kind of people. <laughs> we're sort of like the kind of people who will go there and spend a few days and just go eat all the good stuff and just walk around mm-hmm. and look at the beautiful city. That's us. Well, the good thing is there's always something to do. Even if nothing's happening, something's always happening. So I'm sure you enjoy it either way it goes. <laughs> Absolutely. And when nothing's happening, there's like a jazz funeral down the middle of the street. Right. There's some type of second line for a wedding, a funeral, whatever. It's always a celebration. That's right. It's crazy. I love it. I love the atmosphere and how friendly and warm everybody is. Um, well, I've never been to San Antonio. So what? like, help me out. What can I come see there? Well, of course, we have the Alamo. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the best Mexican food, in my opinion, in the entire country. Really? Yeah, San Antonio is uh, pretty well known for its Mexican food. I love Mexican. That's my favorite type of comida. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, that's just because you've had your fill of etouffee and Creole and all the good stuff. You're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> So you were born and raised in NOLA. Are you a first-generation New Orleans girl, or is it like a long line of family? It's a long line of family, Steve. <laughs> All of my my people are here. I don't really have family across the state or the country. Everyone's focused in New Orleans, and I love it that way. <laughs> That's really cool. That speaks again to how awesome New Orleans is, is that nobody ever wants to leave. Oh, it's crazy. It's it's kind of hard to leave. It's like quicksand, but you get the party in it. <laughs> you just get deeper and deeper into New Orleans. And That's before funny. you know it, it's like, oh, it's been 10 years. I should probably venture out to a different part of the map. <laughs> yeah, I should go see a different part of New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I should go visit Metairie. <laughs> you get it. West Bank. Yeah, let's do that this weekend. <laughs> You totally get it. Yes, I I love that town. So, did you go to college? I did. I went to the University of New Orleans. Oh, to be what? That's what I was going to say. To be a veterinarian. Uh, (laughs) So, when I started college, I had a lot of influence with people telling me, you know, I should go with something that 
can definitely make money. And I always did have a passion for animals. I used to find strays and, you know, bring them home. I've had all types of pets under the sun and drove my parents crazy with that. So I was like, okay, well, fine, I'll do that, but I'm still going to act on the side. So I minored in film. And after one semester, sees, I was like, you know what? There's no way I'm not following my passion 100%. There is no need for this plan B if I have a strong plan A and if I believe in myself. So I majored in film, theater, communication arts ever since then. And yeah. <laughs> what about it. what about taking those those classes sparked that passion? What was it that ignited that fire? The unhappiness. Just so much unhappiness in all the other classes that I was taking. And then when I went to my my one film class I had that semester, it just I felt like I came alive. I felt so comfortable. I just felt like it just was a feeling. It's kind of like that, you know, you know, when you know, you know. So I went with it and I'm glad I did because it took me pretty far. (laughs) That's funny. Uh, So, you know, you know, when you know, you know, you know, (laughs) you said you had a a, every kind of pet that you could imagine. What's the most unusual pet you had growing up? Oh, God. Um, Don't say an alligator. No, my mom wasn't going to have that. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Look, I pushed the limits, but she didn't let me cross some lines. So I think the most exotic would be between my miniature Shetland pony and my sugar glider. (laughs) Oh, um, oh, oh, whoa. Okay. So uh, a sugar, a sugar glider. That's crazy. (laughs) Um, I know. But. Aren't no. Shetland ponies already little? So you had a miniature Shetland pony, so it was extra, extra little? Yeah, yeah, it was a miniature Shetland pony because, I mean, I don't have, a, I didn't have a whole lot of land at the time. <laughs> so um, I got the pony mainly for me to enjoy, along with my nieces and my nephews. I have plenty of those, and I'm a big part of their lives. And I was like, you know what? And I could also convince my mom by telling her hey you know i'll even make some cash and give you the cash if i can keep the pony here and i'll make the cash with doing you know birthday parties pony rides (laughs) well uh little did i know my pony was the most stubborn pony in louisiana and (laughs) hated being ridden hated getting in the trailer that i bought him and hated that i probably named him magic since he was a boy so yeah it didn't really work out (laughs) didn't work out well how tall was Magic? I don't know his exact height. I am five foot even. I'm a very short person. And he came up to my ribs. So, yeah, put that in perspective for you. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, my wife is yeah. also five foot, and I think that is the perfect height. So, not Uh-oh. a short person, Thank but you. a perfectly proportioned person. Thank you. I consider this average height. <laughs> You're living in New Orleans, and you graduate, and then what's the next step? So you graduate from what you said, New Orleans University. Mm-hmm. And then what was yeah. your what was your plan after that? What what were the steps? Well, there wasn't a plan after that. The whole plan has always been follow your dreams, get your education on the side, make money on the side until your dreams become your main income. So I just continued following my dreams. I had some side gigs. I really love kids, like I said. So I started teaching preschool, and I did that for about three years. Oh, wow. (laughs) And, yeah, I love children. So And I'm very animated, so they love me, too. And it was just a great relationship. But after a while, it was like, okay, I need something more up my alley, you know, concerning my career. So what I did was I started doing career consulting. And that's what I do now. I help um, beginning actors put their foot into the industry and help them figure out how to take their career into their own hands. Instead of looking around like, what do I do? And just, you know, doing random plays, helping them actually like set a goal and reach it. Interesting. And this is called career consulting? Mm -hmm. Or career counseling. People call it different things. Okay. (laughs) This is going to sound really rough and i do not mean it that way at all okay mm-hmm. okay so coming from three years of teaching preschool how do you sell yourself as an authority on counseling a career in acting 
You know what's funny, Steve? I asked myself that. I was like, how the hell are people going to come to me when I haven't reached my main goals yet, when I haven't even reached the big screen yet? And so basically my bookings over the years have done enough for me. So the people who come to me, they're, they're just trying to get into acting while I've been in it, you know, well, now over 10 years. But at the time, at least five, six years. And they've seen my work. They've seen me on TV shows that they love. And that's where they want to be. So if that's like their biggest goal at the moment, and I've already reached and surpassed that, they feel comfortable coming to me for that reason. That makes so 100% I help them get to where I sense. That makes 100% yeah. sense. So I don't say I know everything, but I can't. I explain, you know, why I do it and, you know, my experiences and my work. I let them check me out. And if they feel comfortable enough and, you know, I feel like I can really help them, then we do the consultation. And it's been working out for me. I think that's awesome. It, it it sounds like you're telling people, I will help get you to where I am. And then mm-hmm. after that, you know, you can keep on with your success and your, your journey, mm-hmm. but I'm going to ha- give you a hand and help you get to where I am currently. Right. Right. Because that's the hardest part. It's just like, how do I get in acting and film just seem like this big industry, this big like club that you just have to be a part of to see. And it's, it's really not like that at all. It's all about, who you know, some people, they make it to television and they don't want to give the game away. They don't want to help others. Right. When I am like, you know what, I'll help you for a small fee because I've been scammed and misled my first two or three years in the industry. And I know if I could like get those years back with the knowledge I have now, I would be a lot farther along. So I just kind of want to help each other. <laughs> I think that's real sweet. How did you get started down that career counseling path? Um, I was getting counseled by an acting coach of mine, and I was like, hey, I know a lot of this stuff already. I can do this. <laughs> and so, yeah, ideas sparked, and I got his permission. I was like, hey, what do you think? Like, as a career counselor farther than I am, what about me doing this? And he was like, yeah, to get people on their feet, I think it's a great idea. His name is Lance Nichols. He's a veteran actor. He uh from New Orleans, I believe, and he's, uh, he has a, a lot of success. So with his blessing, I went on ahead and I've been successful with it, too. So I've been very lucky. That, it sounds like you are lucky, but in the in the way that you make your own luck. It sounds like you've done a lot of hard work and thought about some choices before you leapt into anything. And I think that's pretty wise. Thank you. I didn't look at it that way. I'm just I feel so blessed for things to happen the way they did. I know people who have, you know, worked really hard just like me and are still like really struggling with their career and what they want to do. So I feel lucky in that sense, Steve. Well, uh, luck absolutely is a big part of it, but so is preparation and working your butt off. So that's what they say. Luck is preparation meeting opportunity. (laughs) That is correct. So don't miss an opportunity to pat yourself on the back. Don't do it all day long. Like you're a Kardashian or something, but hello, (laughs) every once in a while, just give yourself a pat on the back and know that you're doing the right thing. Um, yeah. You said that, you know, in, in your beginning years, you were scammed? Mm-hmm. Yes. In what way? Um, in multiple ways, mostly with headshots. Um, headshots are the main things that people want to see, uh, even, especially when you're beginning off. And you don't know who to speak to. You, you might have a photographer say, hey, I'll take your headshots. Yeah, I'll do acting headshots. And they'll take a regular photo and crop your face out and print them for you. <laughs> or they'll take a bunch of pictures and only send you the ones they like. And maybe you prefer other ones. And these acting headshots are not for acting. There's a technique to taking professional acting headshots. So that, that was one thing. Another thing, um, and headshots are expensive. So they're like four or $500 that you've wasted and you didn't even get what you paid for. And the casting director is looking like, oh no, this is not on the right paper. This is not a headshot. What is this? So that was very embarrassing to go through that. Uh, also, with classes, people say they teach acting, but they haven't had any experience doing it themselves. <laughs> or, um, you know, all those auditions you pay for. Hey, you're going to, you know, be in front of all these agents and you're going to audition for this Disney commercial and you pay money and you wait in line with hundreds of people and you never get a call back. Or you get a call back and they say, oh, hey, you made it to the call back. Now you have to pay this much to be seen again. <laughs> So it's just ridiculous what people will go through. They will really prey on young dreamers. And I just kind of like to set the bar straight 
and say, you know, this is what you should look out for. Don't ever pay for an audition or an agent or anything up front besides classes. And you have to know that they are legitimate. So I've been scammed multiple ways. (laughs) Wow, that is heartbreaking. It is, which is why I want to help so much. Because I'm like, guys, you don't have to go through all this struggle that I did. I promise. That is so sweet. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about let's talk about you getting into uh, the business. What was your first role in front of a camera that you got excited about? Steve, wait, did I, that I got excited about, or that well, I had in general? Let's say in general, and then we'll go with the one that really made you um, <laughs> know that you were on the right path, that you had chosen the right career. So first, what, well, was, your, what was your first one? Yeah. The first one was a student film at the University of New Orleans, because before that I was doing a bunch of theater and then I got into training for film. So once I booked a student film, I actually booked the lead part for the role of Ada. <laughs> and you can actually find this silly film on YouTube. And it's about New Orleans and it's about voodoo. And I play the main character and I, I die at the end. And it's, it was a really epic role to say it was my first time in front of a camera. So I'm kind of embarrassed looking back at the film because I've learned so much more about acting since then. But it's also cool to look back and say, wow, look how far I've come. And I booked the lead role the first time I booked anything. So that was amazing. <laughs> That's really cool. What was the name of this film? It was called Paint the Town Dead. Instead of red, it's Paint the Town Dead, since it's a like a voodoo type of film. Sure, Paint the Town Dead. Spoiler alert, uh, you die. Yeah, I die. I die, guys. You'll be very surprised how, though, so I didn't spoil it too much. <laughs> oh, interesting. And what was your first paid gig? Was that one paid, or was that just student film free stuff? That was just student film free stuff. They did give us a small, um, <laughs> a small little something something, and they sure. fed as well. So, yeah. Uh, so for my first paid gig, again, another epic role for a first time thing. And the people I worked with were unbelievable because I actually knew them and recognized them from TV. So my first role was with Breakout Kings. That uh-huh. is a series that comes on A&E. It comes on right after Law and Order, I think, usually. And on the episode, I was actually starring co-starring with omari hardwick who is now the star of the hit tv series power oh and so yeah i already knew of him then and had a huge crush on him and i was like 17 so it was a little weird but <laughs> i got to work with him and now that he's doing power and has blown up it just i mean it just adds value to that experience for me <laughs> you know absolutely that's really cool and in the episode that we we star in, he kidnaps me. Like, he puts a pillowcase over my head, picks me up, and physically throws me into a vehicle. So No, no I mean, stunt actress? They had a stunt actress, and I, I was like, I refused to let her do everything. I was like, I want to do this. This is exciting. I'm, I'm in character. My character would do this, and I'm not afraid. It's not hard for me to get thrown into a car. I'm not afraid of that. Uh, there was also a scene where I had to run out in the middle of the street in front of a moving car that slammed on his brakes, and they wanted the stunt double for that. Now, they made her do that part anyway, but I also did it. So I was like, I'm still going to take my chance and be on screen for this, too. And, uh, yeah, I did that as well. I also had to jump out of a window. So a lot of stunts happened that I got to do for my first booking, which was unbelievable. Also, while having a crush on the man doing it, so I'm like, okay, yeah, throw me in the car, but I have to, you know, of course, act like I'm being kidnapped. So that was a challenge. (laughs) You had to act like you didn't like it. (laughs) Right. I'm like, you know, take me, take me, but then, you know, get back in character, Steve. You always got to get back to character. That's funny. So that's, (laughs) that's 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 a pretty big journey from, you know, teaching preschool to, you know, jumping out windows and jumping in front of cars. So let me tell you, it's it's like a dream. Every time I have a day job and I like go on set the next day, I come back to that day job. Like, did that just happen? You know, I still do that. I still feel that way with the with the five feet apart from here. I came back to New Orleans and I just I looked at my house and it just felt so surreal. I just started cry- I cried for like an hour, just happy tears. Just like that really happened. Awesome. Oh, that is so sweet. Yeah, so this is what I've always wanted to do. So now that I'm doing it, 
it's very hard to explain the feeling. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, are you currently in New Orleans or are you in L.A.? I'm back and forth, but mostly in New Orleans because, like I said, this is where my family is and I'm a big family girl. Gotcha. So you just go out to L.A. when you to work and audition and stuff? To work, network, audition, you know, whenever I need to. Like I just came from out there. I was meeting with a manager. Um, I'm trying to move out there soon. I'm kind of working out the kinks on when. Well, hopefully you'll get a you'll get picked up for a for a series and then you'll have to move out there. That is the plan. That is what I'm trying to manifest into my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're in New Orleans a lot. Have you been on uh, NCIS New Orleans yet? I sure have, actually. Definitely. I got to flirt with Lucas Black in the scene. I was one of his groupies. <laughs> I'm sensing so, a theme Lucas. here. I know, right? You see that, right? I mean, there's like this flirty person or a really cool best friend usually. So that was cool because on set, production had no idea that St. Patrick's Day had a parade rolling through where we were. <laughs> and a, a small parade interrupted our shooting for maybe 30, 45 minutes. And everyone that wasn't from New Orleans was like, yeah, what is this? This is such a surprise. Everyone from New Orleans was like, come on, y'all are like making us stay on set a little later. We're shooting here. But I enjoyed it. Me and Lucas Black caught a cabbage from a float, and it was just a very memorable experience with NCIS New Orleans. Very cool. Yeah. A, a little birdie told me that you also love to act in the theater. I do. I love theater. Um, it's honestly been a minute been a minute but i started in theater and i just feel like it's the most organic form of acting that you can get and i have so much respect for the thespians out there and i i'm trying to get back in it now i'm trying to find the time with everything that's going on but theater was my first love and it's probably going to be my last love <laughs> <laughs> I feel like uh, stage acting is the most acting that you ever do all at once, you know, because movies and TVs, they'll be 15 seconds up to maybe, you know, four whole minutes of acting. But if you're doing right. a play, you're doing two hours all at once. Exactly. With film, you like your character gets interrupted. So it's harder to stay in character, especially when everyone's goofing around on set and just vibing. But with theater, you're forced to live in that moment. And then once those curtains close, it's just this feeling like you just come out of your body like, whoa, where was I? <laughs> and that to me is just amazing. I feel like I started there and I feel like when I'm when I'm old and gray, I still try to get back into theater and get on that stage. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. Now, now, I read somewhere and I don't know if this is true, but I read somewhere that you went to the Barbizon School of Modeling and Acting. That's how I got my start. That's how I got into film because I was in theater and I was like, mom, I want to be on TV. So we found this um, acting and makeup modeling training class called, and it was with Barbizon and they, they promised you a lot. <laughs> Barbizon was one of those places where you kind of, you make the most out of what you get there. So a lot of people didn't get agents through Barbizon, but I luckily did because once you graduate, after a few months of going to those classes, they offer you an opportunity to compete with hundreds of actors and models. And they do it in different states each year. For me, it was in Alabama that year. And I was like, Mom, I got a letter from Barbara Zone. I want to do this competition. So she called, and lo and behold, they're like, okay, well, you have to pay your entrance fee, and that's 800 and something dollars. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, my mom, we talked about it for maybe an hour. And she was like, you know, I don't have this kind of money, but, you know, I believe in you and I want to support you to the fullest. So I'm going to do what I can to make this happen. And my parents are such a huge support system for me. And we made it there. And they just needed you to perform a some type of commercial and walk the runway a few times, like modeling. And along the runway would be, you know, maybe 50 to 100 different casting directors, agents, et cetera. So I went to the competition and I did my, you know, my five foot model walk along the <laughs> runway and started my stuff, my different outfits and smiled at all the people that I've seen, you know, along the runway, tried to 
be as commercial as possible. And then once we got to the acting portion, I got really intimidated. Everyone had these like perfect polished commercials, like for CoverGirl and uh, shampoo for their long hair and all types of stuff that I can tell that they rehearsed and like had down pat. And I'm sitting there with my little, <laughs> studying my little commercial that I wrote at home by hand, like pencil and paper and script. And I was like, wow, this is a silly commercial. I should do something more professional. But it was too late. I was so nervous, Steve. But once I got up there, I just kind of, I let it go. I just gave them what I had. I gave them everything I had. And I got a quite a few laughs and a lot more confidence once I did that commercial. Very and cool. luckily, I scored an agent after that. There were about six agents that were interested. Only one was in New Orleans. So me being like, you know, 18, 19, I'm like, okay, I have to go with the one here. And I've been with her ever since. I've been with Talent Connection Agency ever since. Well, wow, congratulations. Thank what, you. What made you decide to write your own commercial instead of, you know, just rip one off like everybody else did? Eh, I don't know. It just wasn't working for me. Everything I read online, I was trying to find something online. It had so many short monologues, short commercials, commercials I could perform. And my mom seen me kind of stressing. She was like, well, don't worry, you know, maybe you should write your own. And I was like, no, mom, you know, that's lame. I'm not going to write my own. Well, that night I stayed up all night, <laughs> crumpling up papers and throwing them across the room until I, I heard my dad snoring. And I was like, somebody needs to fix that. That would be cool if they had a commercial for something that could help my dad with his snoring. So I just wrote a commercial, like a funny duct tape commercial <laughs> about Trina's specialty duct tape that helps, you know, specifically dads with their night noises. <laughs> and I, I performed it for my mom in the morning. I'm like, I didn't write anything but this silly thing for fun. And she was like, Trina, that's hilarious. Use it. So I used it and it worked out for me, I guess. <laughs> now, you said night noises. Now, does that include passing gas? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, man. You see my next original commercial? I'm going to have to, like, quote you. I'm going to be like, you know what? I'm going to have this special duct tape for lower body that there my friend go. Steve helped me come up with on Fascination <laughs> Street podcast. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No, but I should have. I should have added that. Trina's duct tape. It's not just for noses anymore. We. <laughs> that's how you keep making the money that's right <laughs> love it hey streetwalkers well you're not literally streetwalkers but now that I've got your attention I am Stephen O'Reilly and I have a podcast called the Bar Star Podcast and since you're listening to the Fascination Street Podcast I think you should check out my show it's just as interesting without all the famous people, because Steve has connections that I just do not have. But if you dig podcasts about music, working musicians, and other random shit that I decided to talk about, based around music, of course, because that's what I do, I'm a working musician for the past 30 years, then you need to check out the Bar Star Podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast, on any platform, and make sure you check out Bar Star Podcast. Dot com. Now back to the one and only Steve Owens and whatever the hell he was talking about. So you are of Creole descent, right? I am. Yes, I am. 100%. So how is it that you have played a Latino girl before? Well, Steve. <laughs> Steve, it's called uh, acting. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, you know, an accent. Well, you know. Creoles have so many types of shades and colors, <laughs> and I have always been told that I look ethnically ambish, ambiguous, sorry, ambitious, ambitious as well, but ethnically ambiguous. So it's easy for me to play different roles. I've been casted as African-American. I've been casted as Latino. I've been casted as Cuban. So it's really cool because I get to study those cultures when I'm studying that character to help me out. That, that is it really cool. helps me get out of my own self, you know? Yeah, you get to dip your baby toe into somebody else's whole culture, like you said. That's really cool. 
Yeah, I love it. I love it so much. But yeah, apparently most people think I am of Latina descent. So I just roll with it, and I've been trying to learn Spanish because of it. <laughs> oh, nice. So let's talk about standing up, which is that that acting job that I referenced. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what can you tell me about that? How long ago was it? Well, uh, I think that was the second thing that I ever booked. So, oh, wow. you know, over five years ago, over six years ago, I, I could tell you the exact year, but not at home with all my acting stuff. I hang up all my call sheets and my scripts all over my room. There's nothing else on my walls so that I'm immersed in my art and I can just look at it and say, okay, I did this this year. Anytime I'm lacking confidence, I can just look up at my wall. So I can't tell you the exact year, but that was filmed in Georgia in the mountains. So high up in the mountains that there was just like a constant cloud around us. It was just always misty. Wow. It's a beautiful spot. Beautiful spot. And the film takes place, most of it takes place at a summer camp. So that's where it was set. So it was really cool because the place where we were filming was so abandoned. There were people there. There were a lot of town people, but it was so unadvanced tech- <laughs> with technology. They didn't even have public transportation where we filmed. So it was a real, like, escape for me <laughs> and I really felt like I was in that camp like I was immersed in that camp and I'm sure my parents came along but you know when you're filming on set they're nowhere to be found and it was just really cool because I felt like wow I'm one of these kids at this summer camp I've never been to summer camp this is awesome so it was like a really cool experience especially playing a Latina girl with a lot of attitude so that was fun oh a lot of attitude yeah, most of my parts require me to be very spunky. So I guess I can say I naturally hold some spunk within me as Trina, because <laughs> apparently that's what they see me as. And I'm happy for it. I'm rolling with it. I guess so. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I really, really like that you put your work on your walls. That's really, really, I think, a good tip, you know, like you said, to kind of help people stay motivated and to not lose sight of what they have done. I I think that's really, really a great idea. Where'd you get that idea from? My own head. I I went through so many periods of doubting myself because, I mean, you don't get a lot of bookings. You get more rejections than you do bookings. And the rejections are silent. So you're just waiting and waiting and waiting because it can take up to a month for someone to call you back and just say you have a call back or you've been booked. So it's a waiting game. And just after going through those periods of being down because I'm waiting and I'm like, Oh, I've auditioned 50 times and I haven't heard a thing. I suck. And then, you know, I realized I can just look up at my wall and see what I've done. And even doing these interviews and this interview, especially with you, Steve has made me realize how far I've come and how proud I should be. And so I've always had a problem with that. I've always had a problem like patting myself on the back, like you told me to do earlier in the interview. So hanging that up on the wall always helps me with my confidence. It reminds me how far I've come and how gracious I should be for all the experiences that I've earned. Well, I think that that's a great tip for everybody, really, is to put your work on your wall so that you can see it and you can see your progress. And You know, the industry that you're in has a tendency to just beat the confidence out of every single person in that industry. And so I think that's a really good way to fight that. And I love it. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it helps me grow some thicker skin. So now I don't wait for the auditions. I kind of I do my audition and I let it go. And if it's meant for me, you know, I'll I'll be called in for a callback or something. But after so many years of acting, you learn to just audition and let it go and always 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 be grateful and be proud of how far you've come even if it's just a student film because for a long time I just had that one student film under my belt and that gave me confidence to you know book that next role with A&E on Breakout Kings so you know you just look at where you've been and it'll help you get where you want to go it's kind of like a a huge vision board but just on all four walls <laughs> Yeah, and it's a it's a more of a rearview mirror because those are not the things you're trying to achieve. Those are the things that you already did. Right, and that just makes you want to push even more. It's so motivating. I love it. I feel like I'm envisioning you, you know, leaving your audition, getting into your car, and then turning on Ariana Grande's Thank You Next. 
Wow, that's going to be my after audition song, my post audition <laughs> song from now on. I swear to God, thank you for that. That's not every time I hear that song now, Steve, I'm going to think of you, man. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Tell me about the perfect date. Oh, that was cool. I did that one uh, earlier this year. And it was really surprising because I was only filming for a day, but I had no idea who my scene was going to be with. And once I got there, I seen that my co-star was Noah Centino. Really? Now, yes, man. I don't know how I book these roles with these amazing people, but God has been looking out for me because Noah Centino is now blowing up on Netflix. Yes, and I am such is. a big fan, and he's so handsome. So to be able to work with him and actually be another flirty character. <laughs> what? No <laughs> way, you. Super- <laughs> yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> it was super fun. He's such a, a silly character. He's a funny guy just being himself. So the perfect date was really dope. I, I can't wait for that to come out. I'm looking forward gonna, to that. Is that going to be on Netflix? Yes, and I'm in the first scene, so look out for me. A short, it- curly-headed Creole woman. <laughs> 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 well, I'm look, I'm playing a 16-year-old, so keep that in mind. Folks. Gotcha, gotcha. Um. <laughs> I feel like Noah Centeno is going to take over Netflix. He's just going to own it. He, he's so natural. Like, he's such a natural. And the, he's, the, the characters he's playing are so charming. So it just makes you want to see more and more of him. Well, I have seen two of his movies. I want to say they came out, like, at the same time or really close to the same time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, he blew me away. He He's a really good actor. I mean, I... He seems like a nice guy, I guess, according to social yeah. media. But I, I really enjoyed the films he was in. I think he did a great job in those films. Some of the people that were in those films, I don't feel that way about. But him, <laughs> for sure, stood out in both of those films. So I, I think that's really cool that you got to work with him. I think I know which films you're talking about. And I am just going to say I 100% agree. And I'll also say... Since I personally met him and worked with him, that he is. He is the guy that you think he is. He's very sweet, very kind. He's very silly and funny and charming. Oh, that is good to hear. My daughter will be pleased. <laughs> I bet she will. Yes. 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 Uh, she's 27, and she's the one who was like, you have to watch this. You have to watch this. And I was like, all right. And then she's like, okay, but then now you got to watch this one because he's also in it. And I'm like, okay, calm down. <laughs> Calm down. Now you're on everything on Netflix, Dad. I just need you to take a week off from work and just watch Netflix now. That's right. I hope I hope he gets the you know the credit he deserves because yes, he's an amazing actor. Well, I can't imagine a world in which he won't. I mean, if he keeps doing what he's been doing, then he mm-hmm. he is going to make a, a huge splash, you know, on on the big screen um, very soon. I, I really like. Yeah. His work. I hope I get to work with him again. I'm just going to say that I will, and I'm going to say I can't wait to work with him again. Yes, me too. I'm going to tell him. <laughs> I'm just going to reach out and say, hey, look, bro. <laughs> I'm, I'm joining my podcast, bro. No, I'm going to tell him I'm going to tell him to make sure that you're in his the rest of his films. Ooh, you I know. got a shout out. Yes, Steve. Yes, yes. yes. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not worried about getting him on my podcast. Once you're in the rest of his films, you'll get him on my podcast, so it'll be fine. <laughs> That's right. Look, you got to watch each other's back. That's right. <laughs> that is correct. Now, you have a film that came out in theaters last week, right? Like Friday? Yes. Right? March 15th, Five Feet Apart premiered in nationwide theaters. I am in shock. I am still processing the fact that my face is finally on a big screen. So that was my first theatrical debut. Everything else has been television. Um, <laughs> have you seen it in the theater? Uh, yes. I So I went to the red carpet premiere in Los Angeles. Damn. Yes. I was invited to the red carpet for this. And it's, it's blowing my mind because when we first started shooting, everyone understood that this was a low budget film. So we didn't expect it to go as far as it did. We never understood how it could be a low budget film. We were like, this this script is just way too amazing. So the fact that it took off, took me to theaters and took me to the red carpet in Los Angeles, 
like I said, I, I got home. I got home from Los Angeles. I stared at my house and I cried for an hour. I, it was like a dream. I can't wait for more. It, I felt at home on that red carpet. I felt at peace. I felt comfortable. I felt like I was where I belonged. So this film has done wonders for, for me and for so many other people. Once you see it, it is one of the most moving films that I've seen in a long time. Really? Yes, definitely. It definitely delivers a message. It's beautiful. <laughs> well, I can't wait to check that out. Did you get the most annoying question for a female actress while you were on the mm -hmm. red carpet? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, on the red carpet? Yes. Which one? About Cole Sprouse? Is that what you're going to say? No. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. <laughs> But I do want to hear the answer to that one. So hold on one second. Uh, no, I I think that it's the most ridiculous question that they shout at the ladies as they're taking their picture is they say, who are you wearing? Oh, no, I didn't get that. I didn't get that. <laughs> Good. I hope they stop doing that no. forever. That's so stupid. Right. It's like, um, let's worry about who I'm playing in the film or who I am as a person. Who I'm wearing is not really that important. It's just a decoration of what you see. But Correct. the most, the question I got asked the most was, how was it working with Cole Sprouse? I mean, people that don't know me, people from everywhere are messaging me that question, <laughs> that same question. Well, so this it, is going to expose me for the fool that I am. I don't know who that is. <gasps> hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me pick up my jaw. Hold on. Okay, <laughs> I picked up my jaw. Or Steve. I know. Cole Sprouse. Cole Sprouse is one of the Disney stars from Sweet Like Sweet Life of Zach and Cody with the two twins who live on a yacht. <laughs> Wait, is he is he the guy who's on Riverdale? He is the guy on Riverdale. He narrates the show. And he plays like Jughead or something, right? You got it. See, you know Cole Sprouse. Oh, okay. And do you know why I know that? Why? My daughter. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Look, my niece is seven. She's seven, and she's never had a crush on anybody. She always says, boys, ew. Steve, she's seen the movie, and she has been quoting lines. Once again, she's seven. She has been quoting lines from the, from the script. She has draw, drawn multiple pictures of him. She has looked him up on my phone and asked me, like, if I got to touch his hair. <laughs> Like people are obsessed with this guy. He's handsome. And he's charming, and he's he's another really amazing actor. I love his sarcasm and his wittiness. So I don't blame them. But yeah, that's the question. How, how was it with Cole Sprouse? Well, let me throw you a different question. What was it like <laughs> to see your face ten feet tall? Um, <laughs> I was in such shock that I didn't cry for the premiere. Um, and you'll understand once you see the film that it was a big deal that I didn't cry, uh -oh. <laughs> but I didn't cry until maybe the very end because I was in shock. I was like, okay, Trina, this is your premiere. Like all of it was kind of a dream. So to see the movie starting was like, I'm just warning myself. I'm like, okay, pay attention, pay attention. And the whole time my eyes are huge. My jaw is on the, on the ground and I'm just into the movie. I'm into it because I've seen the script, I've read the script, I've fallen in love with the script and the characters. But when you're on set, you only get to film X amount of days. You don't get to see the whole filming of the whole movie right. unless you're the main character. And even sometimes then you can't. So to watch it all come together was a shock. It was a shock because I expected the movie to be amazing and moving and, and kind of silly and funny, but to see it all come together. This movie is, I, I think I read it's number three on the billboards right now. Wow. It, yeah, it's blowing up. And it touches so many people with cystic fibrosis because the main two characters have that disease. And it's touching oh my so gosh. many people. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Now I know the movie because I was trying to, like the whole time I was like five feet apart. How come I haven't seen a preview for this? And I have now that you said that cystic fibrosis thing. That movie looks amazing. It is. It is. I mean, even down to the shots <laughs> it's, it's in the animation in certain part, parts in the music. I mean, 
I appreciated that movie a hundred times more for what it is rather than from just me being in it. Me being in it was an honor after watching it. An honor. So when <laughs> Not you, over-exaggerating. So when you get your, your script for something like that, do you only get your pages or do you get the entire script? Well, when you get your audition, you only get maybe, it depends how many scenes they give you. You might get one page, you might get 10 pages, but that's all you get to see. And you have to decipher who your character is from those pages and a small character description. If you're lucky, you get one of those and you kind of have to figure out your scene. You don't know anything about the film. You don't know the context of anything. You just know, I have to say these lines and be this character. So that was fun. I got some really fun scenes. My character is spunky with attitude. Like I told you, that I'm usually typecast for that. <laughs> so the audition was really fun. And I got a callback and I was like, whoa, okay, awesome. And I go into the callback and it's the same few pages of lines, but I'm in front of Justin and Emily Baldoni and as well as Tracy Kilpatrick, <laughs> um, a huge casting director down here in Hollywood South. Wow. And it's just, it's, it was, breathtaking for those few pages to turn into this this moment right here so yeah once you read the whole once i read the whole script i was like okay i'm a hopeless romantic and i love that there are a few comedic parts in this so i fell in love with that but to see it come to light it's a it's a whole different ball game <laughs> whole now, different thing whole different story did you say hollywood south i did now does that mean louisiana so that includes, basically, I think the main two areas for Hollywood South would be Louisiana and Georgia, mainly Atlanta. Right. But I do hear about some, some things in Tennessee and Mississippi, some small things going on, Texas to Florida, maybe. Yeah, where my but Dallas at? You heard me. <laughs> 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 That's my New Orleans coming out. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so basically, I think the main two focus cities, New Orleans and Atlanta. That makes Hollywood sense. South. That makes sense. Yeah. I've talked to a lot of people who film in both of those. So uh, I think you are spot on. <laughs> That's where most of my credits come from. I film mostly in Hollywood South for the most part. And it's really good because, you know, a lot of productions come down here and they already have the, who they want in mind for the lead roles. So they fly them in from L.A. or New York. And then they they want you to work locally so that they pay less for the production. So they hire a whole bunch of locals for the smaller roles. So this is a really, actually a really good spot to build your resume as an actor who's just starting, which is cool because, you know, all the people that I'm counseling for career counseling, I have, you know, direct productions I can point them to, direct background work, direct training, because everything's here. Oh, I think that's awesome. That makes it a lot easier, uh, you know, to, to be this counselor. That's really cool. Yeah. And it's weird because I get people from, you know, all over the the country and the state that are like, help me. And I'm like, um, Come on down here and I will. About, <laughs> right. Like, what can I tell you about your area? But I can tell you the basics. And, you know, if they're okay with that, we'll still go through with the session. <laughs> yeah. Hollywood cool. South is where it's at. See. Have you worked in New Mexico yet? Not yet. Yeah, no. yet you will. It's coming. New Mexico. That's where. Yeah. That's where it's at too. <laughs> yeah, they, there's a lot of stuff going. The shooting in New Mexico. A lot of stuff. Oh, um, I had no idea. Yeah, you know, like Breaking Bad and like just all kinds of crazy stuff. It's it's filmed in New Mexico all the time. So oh, keep, okay. keep your ears keep your ears open and your eyes peeled. You're going to be heading to New Mexico very soon, I think. Ooh, you're telling my future. Say more good stuff. I like it. <laughs> I am telling your future. It's uh, like no, I am a voodoo Pino. priest all myself. No, it's in Pino, New Mexico. Oh, you're bringing That's the right. voodoo back? You know, I started that way. I'm all for it. <laughs> I know. F finally, I want to talk about Claws. Now, is Claws that TV show, I think it's on TNT, that's about some criminal nail techs? <laughs> that show is crazy. That show is so cool. The two people that... I was really excited about meeting on that set was, of course, Lucy Nash uh -huh. <laughs> and Karuchi, because those two people are uh, really popular right now on social media. So I seen them a lot. And so after scrolling through so many pictures of them, too, and um, getting into Claws, 
it was like, okay, I wish I could work with them. That would be so cool to work with those people. They seem so fun. And <laughs> like maybe a week later, I got the audition and I booked it. And it was for the role of Yolanda. And she's this spicy Latina woman who is a client in the nail shop. And I speak my opinions on abortion and other, you know, oh, very, uh, <laughs> right, I just kind of slipped that in there. Very heavy, heavy conversation topics. So, but it's a, it's a really cool scene because it involves the whole cast. And I come up on the screen in like a grid, a colorful grid, kind of like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> and we're all talking to each other through that. So that's season two on the episode named Cracker Casserole. <laughs> yeah, it's a very look, 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 Steve. It's a touchy episode, okay? Alrighty. Very touchy, but okay. it's really cool because that episode stood out to me a lot for that reason. So that's why I love that I was a part of it. Very cool. Did you die in that episode? Let me say no, no. The the blonde wig they made me wear did die though. That wig, <laughs> that thing was ripped off my head the moment we we finished. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Look for so, a short blonde wig and you'll find me. So if Yolanda didn't die, maybe she'll come back if she's a client. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm hoping. Because I, I know they're going to be filming another season. So I'm crossing my fingers and my toes and everything else that's crossable over here. All right. <laughs> uh, all my street walkers, all you listeners, what I need you to do for me is I need you to tweet at Claws, the TV show. And uh, just tweet hashtag more Yolanda. More Yolanda. Woo! Yes. All right, guys, let's get that yes. hashtag going so that uh, they can remember what an awesome job this young lady did. Yes, I would love that, guys. <laughs> Bring me back. <laughs> yes, let's do it. Now, <laughs> Trina, bef before I let you go, is there anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? I... I you know, I really, I'm really all about helping others. And I feel like this movie, Five Feet Apart, has made me realize that more than anything, because a lot of people just, a lot of people don't have the will to live. They have the will to exist, but not to live. And, you know, I've had friends who, you know, were, was like, what's the point of life? What's the point of this? You know, just so down. And after they've seen that movie, and even after me, it's like, there's always a reason. There's always a life worth living if you create it. And these two characters, Stella and Will, they find reasons to live, even though every day they're dying. And then they know that death is near and they have this sentence on their life, but they find a reason. And I'm not going to give too much away, but the main character, Stella, her reason for living is for others. It's for her family. And it's, it becomes for Will, too, even by the end of the film. So. Not to spoil too much, but I just really want to help others. So if there's anything I want to say before we end this, it's two things. I want to tell people what they should do and shouldn't do if you're looking to get into the industry. So what I think you should do is never give up. Post your work all over like I did. Never give up and never let anyone tell you that you can't do something. So many people are like, oh, but I look like this and I have to be this tall. And it's like, no, no, not at all. Acting is literally the imitation of life. And so life in stories consist of all shapes, sizes, and color people. And so it's a, a need, a need, especially for the people who feel like they're unattractive even, you know, because though all, all looks are needed. So don't ever let anyone tell you you can't because you can. Uh, I've, I've been a witness of that. And my second thing that I want to say is just keep at it. Consistency is key. I've been at this for 10 years and I'm just now seeing myself in a movie movie. <laughs> Although I've had so many blessings along the way that I've earned, each one gets you a little farther. And I've gone like months and months without hearing anything or working. But if you just stay consistent, you keep knocking at that door, that door has to open. It has to. <laughs> the force that you're going to put on it is going to open for you and opportunities are going to be presented so just be prepared and take them and keep keep planting them seeds because eventually little flowers are going to start to bloom <laughs> every now and then and then one day you're going to have a huge tree 
And so I'm working on my followers right now, Steve, but I want everyone else to, to not give up, stay consistent, because when you plant seeds, they have to grow. Just water them. That's all I can say. I love it. I do want to point out that when you were talking about some of the things that you've done, you did you you said that you're blessed and that you earned them. So thank you. I feel like I'm getting through to you. You're taking a little you bit are. of that credit. Good job. You did earn those things. Um, <laughs> you sound like my parents. They're like Trina. You you're doing great. Like tell like you need to realize that. And I'm like, but right. I'm more. I'm so ambitious, but also just so grateful for for where I've been. Well, I think that is a, a, a great attitude to add to your, your spunky spitfireness. Hey, yeah, ow. <laughs> and now you, you did say a minute ago, you said, you know, some people say, oh, well, you know, I have to look like this or I have to be this tall or I have to be this color. Everybody listening, whenever you start feeling like that, I want you to look at Danny DeVito and remember he's had a 40 year <laughs> career. 40 years. And he's great, but he is not traditional in any sense of the the word in, in the nope. acting business. So you don't have to be anything. And so many people start late. I mean, look at Taraji P. Henson blowing up at her age. Not that she's old, you know. Hey, but, you said at her you know, age. She has been at it a while. That's all I'm saying. She and has. That's the truth. Man, nothing can stop you. In no, Only nothing you. Can stop you. Only yeah, you, you can stop you. You can stop you, yes. But nothing and no one else yourself just remember that trina lafargue i think that is a great thing to go out on can you tell everybody real quick where they can find you on social media yes please follow me on social media guys my follower account is not great right now so help me out so my main account is with instagram and i'm just gonna spell it out for you really quick it's just at my name my name is spelled p-r-i-n-a-l-a-f-a-r-g-u-e trina lafargue so, yeah, that's that's it, guys. Please follow me. Tell people to follow me. I give great content. I love to motivate. And I can't wait to hear from anyone who's here, who's listening right now. Facebook Alrighty. and Instagram. <laughs> gotcha. Facebook and Instagram. Trina Lafarge, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to hang out with me and, and let me get to know you a little bit better. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me on the Fascination Street podcast. Please. It was our pleasure. Thank you so much, Trina. You have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You have a better one. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. Bye. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Hey guys, this is Steve Owens from Fascination Street Podcast here with a very important message. I'm awesome. I bet you thought I was going to say something else, but nope. What's important here is that I am awesome. I started this show because I truly believe that everybody has a story and I'm fascinated to hear those stories. In the short time I've been doing this show, I've interviewed actors, directors, writers, inventors, podcasters, musicians, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, actual war heroes, even a Bond girl and a luthier, whatever the hell that is, and of course, regular people. From people who wanted to be stars but never gave it a real try, to big company CEOs and people who got to meet their favorite president. I love getting to meet and speak with people who have a story to tell. I feel like everyone does, and it's my job to get them to tell it. You never know who my next guest will be. An Academy Award winning actor, a platinum selling musician, or your own mother-in-law. But one thing is for certain, you will be fascinated by their story. So come take a walk with me down Fascination Street. You can find Fascination Street Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and of course, FascinationStreetPod.com. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.